Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this very special AMA episode of the Clinton Dunley Show. I'm your host, Mona, and I'm here today with the president and the founder of Crypto Tax Audit, Clinton Dunley himself is here. Uh, and by the way, he's now the host of his own new show on Spotify and iHeartRadio, I uh, The Clinton Dunley Show. So be sure you're going to check him out there. Clinton, hello and welcome to the show. It's a special pleasure to be here and to have you hosting it. I'm so glad to be here. We are happy to have you. You know, I am actually so glad that we're having this AMA session because guess what, people? There's only five weeks left to pay your taxes. And yes, that includes your crypto taxes. Uh, and I'm sure, Clinton, you are just getting bombarded with questions already, uh, especially probably this year because... After the crazy wild year we had last year in 2022, people must be just asking a lot of questions this year. There are a lot. There's a lot of concerns. People have a lot of worries and fears. They fear it's a down year. It's interesting. A lot of people say, oh, I lost money last year. But actually, uh, all they lost was unrealized gains. When they sold it, they actually made a profit. So that's a little bit of a surprise for some people. I think maybe the biggest question people are asking this year, Mona, is, uh, they lost money in any number of, you know, BlockFi, FTX, Celsius, you know, UST, Luna. You know, there's so many areas where people have lost big, big investments. Some of my clients have lost millions, and you know, they're worried. Or is there a way to make a uh, some tax benefit out of that? Is there any way to capture some glimmer of redemption out of such a loss? Absolutely. And all those topics that you just, those are our topics actually of today's discussion, those key points that you just mentioned, so many collapses, so many people lost so much money, unfortunately. And this is the year that it's going to get accounted for and people are concerned. They want to know, how do I go about these million dollar losses, hundred thousand dollar losses, even thousand dollar losses we're going to discuss all that that is why we are here today for clinton to answer your crypto tax questions uh, and this is going to be our plan clinton for the first half of the show we're going to address questions that your clients typically ask you um, and then that's usually i've heard and your team has told me it's usually regarding crypto taxes uh specifically as you were talking about um crypto gain calculations. That's a huge topic that we're going to have to address. Uh, then we have tax reduction strategies for crypto traders uh, and also questions clients often ask about leaving the U.S. Uh, to protect their crypto taxes or uh, assets, I should say. That's a hot topic right there. And we're going to discuss that as well. And then the second half of the show, guys, we're going to take your questions live on Twitter and on YouTube. In fact, if you're watching right now, you can start entering those questions. Um, our team will pre prepare those questions for us for the second half of the show. And Clinton is going to go through them and we're going to address them for you. But first... Be sure to follow Clinton on YouTube at The Clinton Dunley Show and on Twitter at Crypto Tax Fixer. That's where you can leave your questions and also stay up to date on important crypto tax information. All right, Clinton, are you ready to make taxes sexy? Taxes are sexy. <laughs> You know what? That's you know what, guys. That's what Clinton always says. Taxes are sexy, and we're gonna find out by the end of this segment if you too believe taxes are sexy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to get us uh, started first off with uh, let's talk about this. Uh, let's start basics. Let's talk about this very important questions because so many of us seem to still be stumped on how cryptocurrencies are taxed. I mean, it's like we still haven't figured it out. So can you please go over this with us again? Uh, I know you, you mentioned it on my show, and I know you've mentioned it on your podcast, but there's so many new uh, listeners and viewers today, with us today, and they want to know, how are cryptocurrencies taxed 
in the U.S.? Well, there's two ways in which it's taxed. And the IRS asks a question on your tax return right on the first page that try to hit home this message. If you receive cryptocurrencies as a reward, an award, or payment for goods or services you provide for somebody, that's treated as income. It's taxed at your at your ordinary tax bracket. Bracket, it's taxed in U.S. dollars at the time that you got it. The second way cryptocurrencies are taxed is if you sell, exchange, or otherwise dispose of or unload your ownership of a particular currency. It does not matter what you bought. It doesn't matter if you got a stable coin, another currency, another token, or fiat. It's just that you gave up ownership to one that you already had. When you do that, you experience uh, hopefully a gain, maybe a loss, of from the price that you originally acquired at. At the end of the year, your net gains and losses are added up. And if you have a, a net gain, then that is taxed as what we call capital gains. And it's taxed either at your ordinary tax bracket or if you held it for more than a year before you sold it, it's taxed at a lower rate, typically 15%. This is the most you important know. question. So many people are confused on this idea of, they think, well, if I go from one currency to another, I don't have to pay taxes until I come back to cash. No, no, no. Every time I switch it from one currency to another, I've created a taxable event. And that's how the IRS looks at it. I, I Can I say I was one of those confused people? I always thought, unless I pull it off the exchange and put it back in my bank account, I don't have to file taxes because I'm not spending it. It's sitting there. Wrong. Correct? That's correct. That's correct. Wow. Wow. Incredible. I mean, this is, this is a huge thing that, I mean, even when I talk to my friends and family, they all, they always thought the same thing. It's kind of like, Hey, it's not an IRA. You know, you, it's not like if you take it out, then you're going to be taxed. It, every transaction, uh, as you were mentioning, you're being taxed on. Um, thank you for that. I want to talk about uh, crypto amnesty initiatives as well, because you recently made a proposal about the IRS giving crypto traders amnesty and helping them get back into uh, compliance. Can you share more of that initiative with us as well? Yeah, it's, I'm very passionate about this. I mean, we've been doing crypto taxes since 2018. And a lot of people had the same misunderstanding that we just talked about. So one year they didn't file the taxes, didn't think they had to for these very reasons. And then the next year comes around and it's a down year. They didn't think they made anything, didn't report their cryptos year after year until they realize all of a sudden, oh, I should have been paying all along. And now they realize they owe so much and their cryptos are worth so little that if they ever possibly reported these things, they would just be wiped out financially. And so they continue not reporting. And this is the case uh, for many crypto investors. We know statistically there's roughly 50 to 60 million crypto investors in the U.S., according to Coinbase. And IRS statistics would suggest that as many as 80% of them are not reporting their crypto income. They're not even, or some of them not even filing tax returns at all. You know, I was yeah. just at a conference in Miami and like every other person I talked to said, no, I don't file a tax return. I'm really <laughs> shocked. So wow. the problem is we have, uh, I mean, in, you're in the neighborhood of like 50% of, of, uh, uh, I don't know, the younger generation, people below 30 yeah, years of age, they all have cryptocurrencies and a high number of them are already in a state of tax fraud without even realizing it. And the IRS is poised for a crackdown. They got $46 billion from Congress. Their, Congress has weaponized them to go after specifically cryptocurrency investors. And I think, wait, hold on, let's, 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 the IRS needs to shout loud, now's the time to come in before the guns are unleashed. And people give people a chance to get current. And the way we've done this before, the IRS has done this before for people for foreign accounts. Uh, they basically said, you don't have to go back to fix all your tax returns, just like the last three years. 
and they will waive all the penalties. You just pay the taxes and interest and you can get back compliant again. And we're not going to give you excess scrutiny. And we need something like that because there's a lot of people that have gotten into a fearful situation uh, and that they're hiding. Uh, and that's not the way we don't want to see 20% of the electorate uh, be in a position where the IRS is targeting them for massive crackdown. So I, I think what we got to do, I have a proposal. We have a, a website cryptotaxamnesty.org and it explains everything you should contact your legislators your two senators and your congressmen and just say hey we need crypto tax amnesty now and uh, you should feel safe contacting your congressmen and your uh, legislators they're not going to turn your names over to the irs it's they just want to know that you're a constituent and everybody needs to do this whether you're a crypto investor or not every crypto investor needs needs either somebody you or somebody you know needs crypto tax amnesty wow you know i, I and by the way uh, if you guys are missing any of the links that we mentioned our team will have those links for you in the note section of the video uh, but clinton as you were talking and especially when we were talking about millennials Remember, uh, you and I often talk about these economies that are being created in uh, gaming, right? Uh, because gaming is becoming a lower barrier to entry. It just inspired something in my mind. I was thinking about Gen Z because Gen Z is even, uh, let's go younger than millennials. Gen Z are playing games and they own these tokens. And I'm assuming in order to play these games and have these tokens, they had to have some type of a bank account maybe it's their mom or dad or some a parent how are who's going to be responsible there for for the taxes <laughs> the parents right <laughs> it's, I, I knew a guy who let his daughter parent. trade his name and he was surprised when she made money she, he all of a sudden he got angry at her because he had to pay taxes uh, yes when it comes to games games are kind of interesting because a lot of games are driven on cryptocurrencies, often in their own blockchain or using like Ethereum blockchain for, for what they're doing. But they create like an insular environment that you trade inside of. Maybe it's on a, uh, you know, a, you know, Axie or using a different blockchain. So there's oftentimes very few tools that can analyze the output from that. And game traders tend to do frantic amount of trading if we will call it that you know you're buying a magic sword you're selling this you're doing that and the online services the gaming services keep frankly lousy records for reconstructing what you did uh and it's impossible from those records to even come back and tell the irs from a tax point of view what happened now ultimately the best way to conceive of a game uh, given the lack of tools uh, to support you in doing your tax calculation, is to think of the game as a box. And I move some currency in to initially and ongoingly fund my activities. Maybe it was ETH or some whatever token it was you moved in. You traded frantically, and then eventually you took uh, something out. Hopefully you took some, some benefits out of it. And we look at how much went in and how much went out, and we'll treat that as one transaction so the cost minus the proceeds what you took out would be the the difference would be the gain or loss that you experienced on your gaming activities that's the easiest way to conceive it there's really not many mm -hmm. tools to help you in that space so you might have to do some estimating sure but it's very important for it for people young older uh to know who are playing these games to know you too have to file your taxes uh, if you're here in the States. Uh, I digress, but something we all have to do in the next few weeks is to calculate our crypto gains and losses. And uh, we know there are companies out there in the past few years or a couple of years, I want to say, that are providing these services. But it seems like we're in a complete chaos uh, with these companies. Now, when it comes to calculating our crypto taxes, um, I, I know you covered this on your podcast and you and I also covered this in depth on uh, my show. And for those of you who, who missed it, uh, you can go on my channel, Metaverse Express, to watch Clinton do a presentation on this topic. It was so fascinating, just blew my mind. Uh, you guys can see that there. Uh, but this is such a huge factor in filing our taxes correctly because we need to be able to add up all these losses and gains and frankly 
I'm not going to go through all my transactions on Coinbase to try to figure this out. So I'm going to rely on these uh, third-party companies to do that for me. But it's a whole mess there too. So can you talk to us about uh, this whole crisis that's happening amongst these service providers and what the issue is and how are they not calculating our taxes and gains, um, I should say gains and losses correctly, especially with NFTs and DeFi? Exactly. You know, the emperor has no clothes. The issue here is that the services vary in the amount of accuracy that they have. In fact, if you go to their websites, none of them claim to be accurate. In fact, they disclaim it at all in their warranties. They all talk about ease of use and how many exchanges, blockchains they support. But the real question is, can you accurately calculate the answer is, is, is a crisis. For example, we had one client who did all, he did a lot of trading about three, we, he, he would say about 300 trades on centralized exchanges uh, during the, the year of data was 2021. And we put the same APIs and CSVs into all like 10 different services and just the transaction counts all varied one from another. Now there's some reasons why they can vary depending on whether you see something as one transaction or a buy and sell as two transactions. But the answers range from 170 transactions to 26,000. They all have the same amount of data. How can they come up with such wild range of numbers? And the answers are all, I mean, half of them are way over a thousand transactions. So uh, it really, you know, I don't, I can't really account for how they came up with their numbers or what is a transaction. But when we move through over to the question of how much gain was there uh, and we use the same calculation methods and we reconciled it with our own accountants the same way, but they still came up with all different answers ranging in this particular example, which is typical. We did many, many benchmarks. So this is just one, uh, from one, he had about $70,000 in gain to another one. We had $800,000 in gain. That's, you know, it's like 11 fold difference. Wow. That, that's Here's, not even me, on the same yeah. planet. <laughs> They're not even the same planet. So uh, a couple takeaways on this, and I, I can explain why, but a couple takeaways is do not report on your tax return an amount of gain if you don't believe that's a real number. I mean, you know, each of us are had, have like a like range we think we are in. You kind of know how much money you had. And if your answer you're getting from this gain calculation service isn't falling into that space, go use a different one. Go use another one. Use three, four. At least you've done due diligence. And if at the end none of them are right, you should probably still consider reporting your own number because that's probably an accurate number uh, or close to an accurate number. Cause these services are all over the map, literally all over the map. I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. Say the big, if, if you're, if all you did was trade on one exchange like Coinbase, all these services would probably come up with the same answer, but it's when you start moving between private wallets and other exchanges that we lose connection to the purchase price, the cost basis of, of a coin. So for example, you bought a coin for hundred dollars three years ago and you moved it to a private wallet. You decide, Hey, it's time to sell. I move it to uh, Kraken. And uh, at that time that I move it in, it's worth $500. You know, a week or two later, I sell it at the price of $550. How much gain did I have? Well, because we know the history, we know that you had a gain of $450 from 100 up to 550, $450. But if you were using the coin tracking or coin tracker tool, when they don't know the price, they use the price on the date you moved it into the exchange. In our example, $500. So coin tracker would report a gain of only $50. That's nice. Mm -hmm. That's a low number. You'd like that. If you're using Zen Ledger, if Zen Ledger can't find out what the original purchase price is, it's going to assume the price was zero. So Zen, Zen Ledger is going to say the cost was that the gain, the profit was five hundred and fifty dollars, or eleven times more than what Coin Tracker is saying. The real number is four fifty. All right. If you use either one of those answers in the Coin Tracker, you're you're underreporting if the IRS audits you. If you're using Zen Ledger, you're going to be overreporting. So this is the each one of these services does this to simplify the work for you as a preparer because reconciliation is tough. Yeah. And, uh, but at the same time, these introduce certain types of errors, which can get extremely distorted. Uh, so, so yeah, it's a real crisis. Uh, and you know, I, you should be very careful. 
Uh, Clinton, what is, how, where is, where's is the issue coming from? Is this a, a ledger that's still very nascent? Is it that we need these bridges uh, that connect chains uh, and, and bridges will then have to keep track of these transactions? What's missing here? The missing issue is layer one blockchains don't record purchase price. Um, mm. We really have to wait for like a layer two or layer three protocol that actually would retain the purchase price and maybe some tax indicators about that transaction. So for example, I acquire a coin. We The blockchain does not record that price in terms of US dollars. Uh, it doesn't know what fiat currency you prefer. So it just knows on a certain date, you got that coin. We go back, look through historical charts. We go, oh, on that date, you know, Bitcoin was X price and that's what you got it for. So since that, when we move then that coin from say the first exchange to a private wallet, the purchase price information does not travel with it. The original acquisition date does not travel with it. Uh, and then when I go to the second exchange, it doesn't know the original acquisition date, doesn't know the fiat price. And so um, either these services try to make it easier for you by suggesting a price. Their basis for mm -hmm. suggestion is incorrect. So, you know, and to do it correctly, it, uh, these reconciliations, as my manager, my reconciliation manager said, most people have no idea what they're doing when they use these reconciliation mm -hmm. tools. So I would say if you're someone who uh, made, you know, let's say you made several hundred thousand dollars of profit, you really should consider using an outside firm to calculate it. Somebody who's a professional and, and experienced at doing the reconciliation. And you have that professional right here, guys. So, and there are not many of them out there. I'll tell you that right now. And that is the truth. Um, thank you for that explanation. And I want to talk about um, another situation that we had, especially last year. And that is, uh, and, and that situation is now triggering the idea of theft losses instead of capital losses. Uh, and that being the recent SEC indictment of Do Kwan, the founder, of C the founder and CEO of uh, Terraform Labs, and, and that's the company that created Terra Luna and the UST stablecoin. Can you also talk to us about that situation? A lot of people were affected. I mean, people lost m hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. How does that situation affect U.S. taxpayers this season? That's a great question, especially when it comes to the losses. The tax law limits how many, how much we can claim in terms of capital losses in a, any given year. So you have to pay, if there's gains, you pay taxes on all the gains. But if you have losses, this would reduce your taxable income. You're limited to a $3,000 yeah. Write off of capital losses in any given year. The excess is rolled over to the next year. Well, when you have massive losses, I have some of my clients had million dollars of losses. Uh, you know, three thousand dollars is is you know this poor compensation. So now, if you can classify something as a particular type of theft loss, then you don't have that three thousand dollar limit. You could actually reduce your taxable income way down. I've had some clients where we brought their taxable income down to zero, paid no taxes. So it's very attractive. What does it take? Well, because of the Bernie Madoff crisis in 2008, 2009, IRS came out with what they they call a, a, a fraud, a criminal fraud loss uh, deduction, where I all I have to do is show that the promoter uh, of an investment was indicted by a federal or state government or agency. As you mentioned, Do Kwan in 2023 was indicted by uh, the SEC. Right? Indicted might be a strong mm -hmm. word, but you know, a legal charge was filed against him. Yep. Uh, and that means that when a charge has happened, that is basically the proof that a theft occurred. And then you can write off the amounts that you'd put in less anything that you'd gotten back from the investment. So that's very attractive uh, for someone like uh, someone who invested in UST or other stable coins because you put in 20000 into the stable coin, you can take a $20,000 loss on it. If you had invested in a currency, 
uh, that had gone up and then crashed, you know, you only can put in the, you only deduct the amounts that you put in. But this, this whole treatment would apply for in 2022, which is the taxes we're reporting now. This would apply for FTX. Uh, I was just going to ask. Block Fi, Block yeah. Fi was Celsius. taken down by, you know, mis misdeeds by Alameda yeah. Research. Uh, Celsius. Celsius. Celsius technically was in the, the organizer that was indicted, I believe, in 23, January 23. So, uh, uh, Mashinsky. And so, but, so, but you know, Alex you could Mashinsky. make a case yeah. that maybe that, anyhow, you could definitely write it off in 2023. You might try writing it off in 2022. Uh, just if you have something like that, you can write it off on sec on form four 4684 part C. I just mentioned that for anybody who's saying, where do I go? But, uh, yeah, I, it's a big deduction and it's a great way to get a silver lining out of your losses. Such a relief that is, I mean, it's not, but it kind of is <laughs> because I mean, we had a lot that went on last year and th this brings me to the whole uh, circus around the exchanges collapsing last year as well. Uh, and the lack of access to user cryptos and even lack of access to transaction records. Uh, now with traders being locked out of their exchanges, what should they do to report their crypto gains or more likely in this case, crypto losses? Well, if you have missing records is a common problem when you're doing crypto reconciliation, gain reconciliation. Um, and you ultimately have to estimate it. So your estimate, because if one point of view is, well, you can't prove what it is, it must be zero. Well, we all know you didn't get the coin for zero. All right. So that's inherently wrong. Uh, you can have to estimate it. How do you estimate something? You go like, well, I think, you know, I, I think I bought that coin in February or May of 2020. All right. Let's go back to coin market cap. What was the price of that coin between in between February and May of 2020? And you're gonna look at a range and you give you even have some justification for picking a reasonable number out of that range and go with that number. Is it exact? Is it the right answer? No, but it's a whole lot closer than any other guess. So this is the you know our tax returns are complicated and you know and short of having a whole squad of accountants doing your work, the best you can do is be close to the right answer. Uh, if you can't be exact, you know, do your best. The law requires us yeah. to have, do a good faith effort. And that's what, and that might involve guessing. And that's all you can do. Do your best. Uh, let's also talk about uh, crypto tax reduction strategies for crypto traders, because you've been providing a ton of great valuable information here today. Will you summarize uh, the top three strategies for reducing tax um, or taxes for, for crypto traders and investors based on the information you've given us so far? The, the easiest, most clean cut type of methods where the first one is to live in a state where you don't pay capital gains. I mean, that's you know, I think we should all be thinking about that. There's a real arbitrage of states these days. Secondly, hold your assets for more than a year before you sell them. This is how the very wealthy people simply save money on taxes. They just don't sell the assets. They might loan them mm -hmm. out, but they never sell them. If they do, it's after a year. After a year, you get long-term capital gains rates, which are a reduced rate of, for most people, 15%. Um, the third method, which is third, this is a big method, is to relocate to uh, Puerto Rico. I'd say this would be a, if you're someone who has in excess of a million dollars in crypto assets and you have the, the ability to relocate to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico is the U.S. tax haven. It is, it, that's, you know, you, you know, for a variety of reasons, uh, relocating there is, has a lot of rules about it, but basically the gains that you experience after you re relocate to Puerto Rico are subject to zero tax. Okay. So if I bought something last year, I moved to Puerto Rico today and I sell it next year. I still, when I do sell it, I pay taxes on the gain up till today, but the gains from now till next year when I sell it, uh, those are tax free. So the secret in leveraging that is to relocate to Puerto Rico when the market is down, okay, so that the 
uh, so the upside that you experience is going to be while you're a resident of Puerto Rico. It's not a trivial action. There's a lot of rules about having to stay in Puerto Rico. Generally speaking, you have to be in Puerto Rico 183 days of the year. You cannot be in the United States more than 90 days in the entire year. It doesn't matter what the reason is. So, you know, that's oftentimes a choice a lot of people don't want to make. But um, if you're interested, there's a, there's a lot of other complex rules. You can call our office to get consultations on it. There's a lot of you know, advisors out there that can give you some insight. That's an ultra-rich the, step. That'd be a high, high net worth strategy. Uh, and I have so many friends, by the way, who have done that. And, and that's exactly why, why they have done it. Um, but before, uh, before we start taking our live questions, and we're going to see if, if we've had any live questions, you said Puerto Rico. I want to ask about expatriation because even around me and the conversations that I have with everything that's going on right now, a lot of people are thinking about their plan B strategy. And for a lot of these folks, the plan B strategy is, like you said, moving to Puerto Rico, but even going as far as moving to Portugal or moving to Mexico. I've even heard people thinking about getting a second citizenship or even renouncing their U.S. citizenship. I mean, there are people are thinking that far <laughs> to, to just save on crypto taxes or not get in trouble. How does that work for a crypto? Well, I do have a lot of people call me up and they, they do tell me the exact same thing. They're, you know, they're planning, you know, for political reasons or feeling unsafe in the U S they have that motivation. Uh, first thing to know is, especially as Americans, we are oblivious to how the rest of the world operates from a legal point of view. Uh, so one point of notice that Americans, as opposed to every other country in the world, we are taxed on our income world that we receive wherever we are in the world. doesn't matter where we earn the money. So if you did relocate to Mexico, the U.S., you still have to file an American tax return, even though you're not living in America, and report all your worldwide income and pay taxes accordingly. There are some good tax breaks on that. You get the first $108,000 of earned, like labor income, is uh, tax-free. Uh, you also get a credit for taxes you might pay in another country for the same income that the U.S. would want to tax, kind of like a dollar-for-dollar dollar credit, which is very nice. And uh, I have a book on Amazon, uh, how to avoid audits of uh, foreign earned income in the foreign earned income credit, which is uh, on that topic. It's the only book on Amazon, so rush out and buy it. So, uh, the I need to get that book. I mean, <laughs> it I it's a very interesting <laughs> book, actually. There is so much taxes. to cover, of course, and there's so much to cover on this topic. But Clinton, we got some questions here. Maybe um, let's look at what people are asking us before we move forward. Uh, Joseph is asking, how do we calculate gains and losses when using a ledger? Very good question. I have my ledger sitting right around here somewhere. How do I do that? <coughs> well, there is a on, on, on a ledger, there is a way to export your transactions. I'm not sure about the format. I'm not sure if there's any. I think some of the, the services, uh, the gain calculation services, can interpret a ledger import and export. But what does a ledger tell you? It just says, you know, on this such such date, you know, a coin came in, another date, coin went out. So, you know, it's, you're not typically selling things on a ledger, at least, you know, you tip, you might sell on other wallets, but not on a ledger. It's difficult. Uh, what happens is you don't import the ledger. You have exchange one, you've moved a coin out. We don't know where it went from that record. And then later on exchange two, we see a coin has come in. It may have gone to a hard wallet in between. So you have mm. to kind of draw the lines uh, with the reconciliation tool. The reconciliation tool will be trying to sell something and you have to make sure it's connecting up with a purchase price. Wow. I, that's Thank you for that. Uh, we have Dominique here. If a stable coin depeg, can I also deduct those losses? Could you repeat that, please? If a stable coin depegged, can I also deduct those losses? You can deduct it if you sell it. 
So uh, you had USDC and you sold it when it dropped down to 95, then you would, that would be your sell price. You would have made five, uh, you know, or would have had a $5 loss on the number of coins you had. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have a client, I have a, a, a colleague of mine, I say, a friend who he lives for those events. He lives for mm-hmm. aberrations and price, things like that. And he sets buy orders and sell orders when things drop. So he watches for spikes up and down on pricing and he'll buy and then sell when it returns back to zero. So when he does, he sells it back at the zero dollar or the one dollar price. So this is where, you know, it's a way of scalping. You're going to make a scalping and have a profit or a loss and they all add up to be your net taxable gain at the end of the year. Uh we also have Litoshis here. I hope I pronounced that right. Probably not. Uh, should maximum value of asset during tax year on Form eighty nine thirty eight Part Six be reported if the if the asset is in cold storage? This is a this is a very interesting question. Let's, a little background on it. The U.S. has a, a tax form called uh, Form eighty six thirty eight specified foreign financial assets. This is an anti-money laundering form. Uh, the law requires you to complete this if you have assets on foreign accounts. Uh, foreign is defined as not U.S. Now, uh, and you're supposed to report uh, the, the maximum amounts that you hold in those accounts. In part six is an alternative way of reporting the total volume of all your transactions when the counterparty, the person you traded with, is unknown or is a foreign person. We get, If they're unknown, mm-hmm. we assume they're foreign. So the question would be cold storage. If your cold storage is like, you know, a private Roger. ledger that you have, well, it doesn't really have a geographical uh it's not tied to a financial institution or financial exchange overseas. So it would be, it would not have to be reported. You certainly could, but I don't think it would have to be reported. Uh, of course, the transactions on a cold storage typically are moving two or four. You're not, you know, the, you are the counterparty on that transaction. So you don't have to report it in part six. But uh, this form is very important. I'll tell you why this form is important. If, so when would you have to report it? Let's say you had coins on KuCoin. Let's say you had 50,000 worth of coin last year at some point in time on KuCoin. You would have to file this form. You know, Well, there's some thresholds. Let's say if you had more than 50,000, as much as 100 or more thousand dollars worth on KuCoin. Um, if you don't file this form and the IRS discovers it, in my opinion, uh, the cryptocurrencies should, exchanges should be reported, then the IRS can use that to suspend the statute of limitations on auditing your tax return. They can suspend it until you eventually do file that form, of course, years later, at which point in time they still get three years to audit your tax return. So uh, this is a very important if you want to protect yourself is to file this form. Uh, secondly, if they then identify income, of course, which would be crypto income, resulting from assets on foreign exchanges, they can hit you with an accuracy penalty of 40%. So it's pretty, this is a powerful tool the IRS can use to uh, really put the hammer down on somebody. Um, I want to go back to something you said, because I want to, I personally want to understand this better. So if, if you recall uh, in 2022, when the exchanges were collapsing, everyone was encouraged to pull their uh, funds from exchanges and put it on their ledger. So are you saying that if we all took our funds and put it on here, we don't necessarily have to uh, report on this? Well, yes, right. There's, let's look at it a couple different ways. Was that a sale? No, it's your asset. You moved it from here to there. It's, you know, it's still your asset. You still retain ownership of it. You have not sold it. It's no taxable event. Uh, since it's not a foreign um, custodial service, you know, it's yours. Uh, it's, it's not a foreign activity that I have to report on Form 8938 either. So mm-hmm. does that make sense? Yes, yes. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that because I myself transferred everything here 
And I do transact from time to time on this. So I too was wondering what happens there. So thank you for that. Uh, I think there was a question here I may have missed. I don't know if uh, I asked this question. I'm trying to file taxes and had transactions on Binance.com. I have now been restricted, locked out of my account. I'm finding it very difficult to retrieve this information. What should I do? A uh, good question. Um, <laughs> Binance, good question. Yeah, I mean, Binance has chosen to not uh, come. There are certain laws that foreign financial institutions have to obey uh, if they have if they interact with U.S. taxpayers. Binance has taken the position of we're getting rid of all our U.S. taxpayers so that we don't have to report to the U.S. government, and as a result, you get locked out. Uh, the IRS doesn't care if you trade on Binance or not. You know, you are totally free as an American to trade anywhere you want, as long as it's not uh, Iran, North Korea, uh, or one of these you know sanctioned countries. So sanctioned yeah, you can trade with yeah. Binance. But now Binance doesn't want to talk with you, and they're being uh, pricks about it. So what can you do? Well, you can typically what we do is we email support at binance.com and state your account, state you're trying to get all your transaction records out uh, so that you can file tax reporting. And generally, if you tell them you're doing it before the IRS, sometimes that gets their attention and they're, they're much more responsive. They should send you, we've had a lot of success with this, uh, and people get CSV files of their past transaction history. Yeah, and actually, uh, Joseph uh, was asking here, are exchanges not required to provide a 1099? They did provide a 1099. I'm pretty sure I got a 1099, right? Interesting. Uh, some exchanges did 1099s. Uh, Coinbase was forced to do it for a couple of years, and then they decided not to because the uh, the guidelines for how they have to fill out the 1099 do not match how you pay taxes on it. For example, uh, let's see, uh, BlockFi got a lot of people upset because they put people put money on BlockFi and then borrow against it. Now, borrowing sums of money are, is not taxable as long as you're in a position to still pay it back. But the 1099 that Binance was issuing treated all those loans as though they were cash payouts that you have to pay taxes on. So it caused a lot of problems. Where we're at right now is that Congress passed a law to create a new 1099. It's going to be called a 1099-DA, digital asset. Uh, you'll, you'll start to see it next year in mm -hmm. January of 2024. Uh, it's still going to be an imperfect form. Uh, we haven't seen the final release of what it's going to look like, but all the difficulties that we've already discussed in terms of you know what did you what knowing what your cost basis was is still going to be present in this 1099 uh and so well it'll be more of an it, you know it, it's the it's the government's attempt to learn more about your trading behavior it's still going to create a lot of complications in audit risk for people you have to when you're doing your tax return account for all these 1099s uh, oftentimes what you're gonna have to do is is do subtractions. You have to subtract or adjust to get it to be correct on your tax return. Of course, of course. Uh, last question before we have to move uh, forward, and that is from the host herself. Um, I have questions about NFT taxes. What do I do about my NFT gains from, say, OpenSea um, or any of these marketplaces that I've had a lot of gains on how how do we deal with nfts here nfts are are, are are just our same thing as capital assets uh you pay you experience a gain uh when you dispose of that nft so buying the nft is not taxable when you finally sell it the sale price minus what you bought it for is the amount of gain you have if that's a negative number it's a negative number so um that's added to all your capital gains at the end of the year and you pay taxes on your net capital gains at the end of the year. The challenge we have with NFTs is connecting the purchase price to the sale price, especially if you're someone who's trading in dozens and dozens of or hundreds of uh, NFTs. I will say this, we have at uh, Crypto Tax Audit, we've developed a new tool or we have a new tool that we're using which uses a 
appraised value for NFTs rather than trying to go back yeah. and find the actual transaction value. So this has a lot of legitimacy. And what we've discovered is that in, you know, we already know these gain calculation services have some weird things going on inside them. What we found was even the best ones that were able to come into a price that's roughly one fourth of what those services are doing by using the appraised value. And the appraised values are actually something that's defendable for the IRS. So, so this is a very exciting way. It, you know, when I say you're going to save a fourth, uh, I mean, if we're saving thousands of dollars, it's paid for the entire gain calculation service that we would do for you. So, wow. I mean, we have our, at, our, at our company, we do our own gain calculation for people. It's a full service. You know, we're not leaving half of it for you. We do the whole thing. We tell you the final results and we defend it before the audit IRS if there's an audit as well as prepare a tax return and defend you in audits so well thank you so much for you know answering these questions and i've always said even when i was looking to bring someone on uh, on my show metaverse express to uh, answer some of the questions that people constantly ask me in this space about taxes it, you know there're really not a lot of people out there who have the knowledge uh, that you have and willing to be uh, you know, on stage and sharing it with, with the folks out here that truly aren't, I could probably count maybe with one hand, the number of people that are out there. And I'm saying it, in the world that are coming to the forefront and saying, hey, we can answer some of your questions that actually do something about it and help you. Um, so thank you for being here and sharing your knowledge and expertise. And I hope people who are, who are listening at home, uh, you reach out to Clinton and his team. It's only a few weeks away from tax season. Uh, you have to turn in your taxes. So I hope uh, if you have any questions, you know that Clinton and his team are here uh, to answer those for you. Uh, Every time, Clinton, we talk, I learn more and more about the complexity of crypto taxes. Uh, and, you know, we're all just kind of paranoid to do what's right, right? And especially this year. But even doing everything right doesn't seem to prevent us from uh, being audited by the IRS. So as we start to close here, what's your advice uh, for crypto traders and investors to protect themselves this tax season? Well, do your best to report your income. Make sure it's a number you believe in, and then you'll be paying a tax that you can believe in. And then I also recommend for our clients to become uh, audit defense members. This is a membership at CryptoTaxAudit.com. And we have three price points. I, I don't think they're on, I think within the next week, I think we're coming up with a new webpage with three price points to, to meet each person's budget and the level of protection that they'd like. But the idea is that we can protect you when the IRS comes to audit. And we know that they're revving up their audit machine and uh, this is the best defense out there. There's nobody else out there doing this sort of work. I mean, an audit, an IRS audit, including a forensic defense and a legal challenge and appeals, you're into 60 to 80, maybe $100,000. So this is, if you have a lot of assets, this is a smart move for you. And uh, we have done over 40 audit defenses. We just wrapped up two audits just this week. Uh, very exciting. They, the IRS has said there's no change on the audit. So, you know, this was a gamer uh, who had hundreds of thousands of trades. So yeah, we, that would be my best advice. And, you know, you mentioned just how there's so much to learn. It is a vast field. It's scary, uh, which in my opinion is why taxes are sexy. <laughs> I mean, you know why they're sexy? Because you make them sexy, because you give us your insight and knowledge that, you know, when, when, when you learn about something, and I'll use Web3 as an example, a lot of people are intimidated by Web3 because we don't know much about it, right? And taxes are just, nobody wants to deal with it, not just because you have to write a check, but also because we just, nobody wants to deal with numbers and we don't understand half of the forms. And, but somehow you make it sexy. And that's why it's sexy. <laughs> well, thank you for doing that for us. Uh, before we go, would you let the folks know once again about the Crypto Tax Amnesty Project? Because that is very important. And I know it's a passion of yours as well. Yeah, this everybody needs to do this. Uh, go to CryptoTaxAmnesty.org. 
and we explain, we have a letter talking about it, and we give you instructions on how to contact your leg legislators. Everybody who's a crypto trader needs to do this. If we can get 60 million crypto traders to call up their legislators, you know, we're going to turn the IRS's heads so fast, right? We do it for yourself, do it for your fellow traders. Also, we have Absolutely. the Clinton Donnelly Show podcast, which is on uh, Spotify, uh, Apple, uh, iHeartRadio. I'm sure there's a couple more, and uh, YouTube. And uh, you can also follow me at Crypto Tax Fixer on Twitter. Yes, you can. And I want to ask you, because uh, I was checking out your uh, page a bit before the show, but do tell the folks, what topics are you covering uh, on your podcast? Well, we we've just got a few videos out because we just started it. We have one where we talked about the four different attack strategies that the IRS has for going after crypto traders and uh, analyze those attack vectors. Second, we did we did a whole video about the crypto uh, Christ, crypto gain calculation crisis. So that's out there. We just came out with an episode on tax amnesty. And I just talked in, in depth with what tax amnesty is and how we run through it. And these videos are all relatively shorter videos. Uh, and we got some really exciting things coming out. I, you know, this is this podcast, you know, I'm not going to bore you with things like the child tax credit. And, you know, we have other things to learn about, but I'm really looking at how taxes and regulation affect our everyday life. And we see it every day. We, the Biden administration just came out with crazy, you know, let's increase the capital gains tax to 40%. OMG, you know, this is nuts. This affects us as a, in our daily lives. They're taxing minors. There's things happening all over. So I look at that from a regulatory anti-money laundering and tax perspective. So I think it'll be thought provoking. Yeah, absolutely. And I want people to uh, go on your YouTube page, Clinton uh, Dunley Show, and follow, subscribe, and more. most importantly, share, guys, because uh, like I said, there are not a lot of people out there educating the folks on these topics. So share the, these videos so it can go through the right channels, get into the hands of the right people who are struggling, trying to find out what to do with all their loss from 2022. Uh, Clinton is giving you the answers, putting it right into your hands and even taking you a step further, uh, helping you, helping you in making it right today and moving forward. Uh, Clinton, we have one question and maybe three minutes left because Joseph, <laughs> who loves you here, <laughs> keeps the asking. Man. Actually, they're good questions. Yeah. Joseph is asking, does it make a difference if a loss is short or long-term capital loss? Yes. The, the way it works out is at the end of the year, when we're totaling up your gains and losses, we separate them into two piles, the short term and the long term. So if you had a short term loss, it would offset or reduce the total amount of short term gains that you had. And then uh, if you have the same thing for long term loss, it's reducing those numbers. So it reduces uh, the net total in kind. And then, it, you know, it, the formula that the IRS uses for working out capital losses is particularly difficult to describe but that that's kind of how it goes down i've actually tried to figure out how to describe it in writing i just gave up well thank you for that i'm sure joseph appreciates it uh clinton we are running out of time here thank you so very much for participating in this ama today and like i said before honestly it's your insight and knowledge that make taxes sexy. I'm just going to keep saying that. Uh, and folks, be sure to check out Clinton's new podcast again, The Clinton Donnelly Show. That's every Tuesday on Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and Rumble. Uh, you can follow Clinton on Twitter at CryptoTaxFixer. And you can also follow me on Twitter at Metaverse Express. That's Metaverse, the word Metaverse, and Express with an X. Uh, and my show airs every Thursday on YouTube. That's where I discuss hot topics in the Metaverse and Web3. Uh, again, thank you all for tuning in. Remember, you have five weeks left uh, to file your taxes. And as Clinton said, do the best you can. And if you need help, you know who to call, CryptoTaxAudit.com. Until then, remember, taxes are sexy. Thank you, Mona.
Excellent job, Mona.